Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome our viewing audience to another exciting session in our Ed Talk series. I am Andrea Ferrari, CEO and founder of Whole Schools International, together with my partner Gabriela Gonzalez Pacheco, Director of Programs. We'd like to welcome you to this innovative space that we have created to inspire conversations around education during these unprecedented times. Education is transforming and at Whole Schools we believe that equity, happiness and well-being are the key to a change that will be sustainable, that will be future-proof and that will meet the challenges of the consequences both in the short and the long term. Uh, it is in this sense that we, um, to raise awareness around this movement, uh, gather here with um, opinion leaders and experts in the field of education to guide our educational communities through their international perspectives as we are co-creating the new landscape in education. And today we are super happy and honored to have with us a colleague and friend, Diego Sanchez from Colombia. Diego is part of our International Leaders Forum. He has been very vocal as an innovator in this field of uh, the challenges of well-being and education. He is the head of the high school and middle school at Gimnasio Los Calvos. Additionally, Diego is a global educator in the International Baccalaureate, as well as for Cognia. He's a leading member of accrediting um, of the accrediting group that leads the accreditations throughout Latin America and um, he's an expert in well-being and innovation. Uh, he knows how to protect teachers from themselves and uh, the fact that less is a lot more and of course skill over will. So we have Diego here with us today to talk about compassion versus compliance and creating productive learning spaces for students and staff. And to kick off our conversation, Diego, we would love for you to clarify the two big C words in our title today, compassion and compliance. What exactly uh, is on your mind when, when you think about this or when you lead for this? Uh, well, thank you for having me. And yes, for me, these are two key words. For me, compassion uh, but what I mean by compassion is concern for others. And obviously, when we're talking about others, in, in our case, as school leaders, and in my case, I'm thinking about my staff and my students primarily. But I'm thinking about their well-being, but I'm also thinking about their learning, their growth, their development. Because I, I, don't, I, I think that compassion is not just about all the, the nice, sweet, touchy-feely things, but I think we have to always be, it has to be tied to our mission and core, our, our core reason for being, which is the, the development, the, the learning of our students uh, and our staff as well. So I think that's what's important for me. So I, 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 I'm a big believer in productive student learning and that what we're doing, um, when we're doing the best for our students' learning and development, I think we're doing what's best for them. And it all comes down to the compassion, the relationship. It all comes down to the student, student, excuse me, knowing that I care for him. I care for his growth. I care for him as a, as a human being. Uh, I'm invested in his success uh, and even happiness. I tend to tie happiness to competency and to doing well. If he's doing well, if you're getting good results, if you're learning, if you're feeling competent in the classroom, like I belong here, I have something to contribute, then that gives you a feeling of of the best kind of happiness, which is not the happiness of just, you know, uh, short term and getting what you want, but a feeling of I'm a competent human being on many levels. And, and I think that leads to important um, feelings of, of, of happiness. Um, and with compliance, what am I talking about with compliance? Compliance is, is, is oftentimes thought of in a very negative way. And it's just doing what you have to do. And I think sometimes we, what we have to do in schools is we have to be very purposeful and very intentional in what we're doing. So if we're asking people to be, um, to, 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 you know, to be compliant and to comply to certain things, we have to make sure, is this really what's best for them? Or is this just a power thing? Is it just that's the way it is and that's the way it's been done and that's the way it's always been done? And in many ways, compliance is easy uh, and uh, because usually it's rewarded in schools. I mean, if you're compliant, it's rewarded in schools. So 
thinking about being compassionate sometimes means over being compliant means really thinking about your intention and what do I really want to achieve here at this moment. Okay. Excellent explanation. I, I love this answer. Um, it's complex, yes. Uh, I love how you talk about manifesting the magic of compassion within the classroom and you and you talk a lot about that in terms of empathy uh, in creating that um, caring, safe environment, um, which leads me to, to think about how exactly does that um, translate into the the virtual classroom environment and if there are some some strategies to cultivate and to nurture this uh empathy this uh compassionate sort of atmosphere whereby we're still being compliant right because we want students to be productive yet we are prioritizing something bigger than that because as gabriela uh often says there is no uh, learning if there isn't a well-being component first. So how does all of that tie into to the well-being and what what might it look like in in the uh, classroom, in the virtual or in the hybrid classroom setting, Diego? Okay, I think first of all, as, as leaders, one of the main things we have to do is we have to be aware of what are our core values, what are our core, what's our mission, what's our vision, and making sure that the initiatives and the programs and the processes that we have are tied to them. So for example, um, a lot of research has shown that uh, Douglas Reeves talks about this a lot. If you have more than six big school initiatives going on at once, uh, you're gonna end up doing a lot less. You're better focusing. So a large part of what I do uh, with my with teachers and with students is that less is more attitude, but less more purposeful, less more intentional, less uh, tied directly to outcomes. So what are the kinds of things that I think is really important? I tell my teachers to stop being the great police. I, our job is not, it's, it's us versus them. Because many, I, I feel that some, even some really excellent teachers fall into that. It's like, no, they have to do this because, you know, like they're not going to get over on me. And, and, and we're not in a competition with them. And I think we have to be the bigger person. We're the adult. And we have to remember we're with a child. Uh, regardless, even if he's 18, he's still our student, he's a child for us. So our job is to see them first as human beings who are in a learning process and not people that we have control over. I think, first of all, we have to begin looking at them from that lens. And I tell my teachers, when your students are doing stuff that maybe they shouldn't or you would rather they not, instead of being mad, you should be sad. You should be a little sad and frustrated like, hey, I wonder what's going on and talk to the student, find out with the student. Because what you value, uh, what you value is, is what usually students will give you. So if you're, if you're valuing grades and if you're valuing the right answer, mm -hmm. students are gonna focus on trying to give you that. But if you're valuing the learning, which is, I think is important, then they're gonna value that. And it takes time, but a lot of it, how does it work in the virtual environment? Using a lot of tools like um, breakout rooms, uh, very simple, um, and, and connecting with kids. Uh, and what we've done at the school, what has happened here at Los Cabos, which is interesting, is I think we're actually doing a lot more what we should have been doing for the last 20 years. We're doing a lot more personalized learning. For example, exams, tests. Uh, when we give them tests, we give them parts that are more like the traditional kind of test. And then there are some open questions, but there is a large, there's, a, there's a, a component, a final component, which is really key. The teachers are meeting with each of the students for five to 10 minutes. And what they're doing is they're having them defend a part of their test, defend their arguments. And that's where we're, where we're really getting to see what they really know and where they, where they need to grow a little bit more. So um, what it means is that the, the, the teacher is scheduling his classes so that he has some time so I could sit with Gabriela. Gabriela, I loved your answer on number four, how you see that the environment really contributed to the downfall of, of Rome. Uh, I'd like for you to elaborate a little bit on that. What else can you tell me about that? Or why do you think that? Why do you believe that? And so we get some really rich discussions which, which really weren't happening in many classrooms before. And, and the way we've done that is 
during your class, schedule your class so you have some synchronous time, some five to 10 minute mini lesson explaining. And then the rest of the class, they're working in pairs, in small groups, uh, using, using collaborative tools like Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, uh, Padlet, they could be working on Flipgrid. It doesn't have to be complex. It just has to be very, something where they're putting together, where they have to work and they have to talk. And as they're doing that, I'm conferencing as a teacher with one group or with one person at a time. So it just takes me five minutes to ask Gabriela what she's doing. How did she get to that answer? Uh, how do you relate that to what we learned two weeks ago, what we were discussing two weeks ago? And then, then I'm really understanding what, what, not only what she knows, but more importantly, what, what she needs and what she needs from me. I think that's important. Um, I think... Uh, uh, Continue. Diego, one question. I think what you're saying are very concrete examples, very specific ones of ways that a teacher can make the student feel valued, which when, when you're talking about the, the, you know, the compassion versus compliance, a student will be more compliant if he feels that he's highly valued by the teacher. So the compliancy comes because of the trust, correct? That um, that it's, it comes naturally when I feel valued by another person, then I will trust, and that that person will guide me in a way that um, that it is is uh, looking out for my well-being and for my happiness. So I love yeah. that you're doing because it's very easy to have that idea in theory, but then to go and find the specific ways in a day-to-day -day practice of a, a teacher. To be able to achieve it, that's, that's the main uh, issue, right? Yes. And the way you make sure that happens is you have like a, a list, like an attendance list. But I have each of my students and I have to make sure I check in with them every week at least or every two weeks, depending on your hourly intensity. So with the class. So, for example, if you guys are my students, I'll, I'll, I write down Andrea, today's date and I'll just write two or three words about what we discussed, you know, uh, checking in on her writing, her thesis statement, whatever. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, then you might miss somebody. This way you make sure everybody, everybody is accounted for. This also helps me, Andrea, for example, kind of like what Gabriela was saying, if I'm meeting with you guys one-on-one -on -one, and Andrea, maybe you're not my strongest student in history, for example but you had a really good point or by me asking some some additional questions you you make your point a little bit stronger so i keep that in mind and i register that because when we go back to the whole the whole group share i'm going to call on andrea and i'm going to say you know what and when we were discussing such and such with andrea she had a really good point andrea i would love for you to share with everybody this gives the, an opportunity not only for andrea to feel competent and as a student but it, get, it allows the other students to say, wow, wow, you know, that's a good answer. Wow, I hadn't thought about that. And I can help guide that. That's fine. Uh, because I'm, I'm helping build that confidence as her as a person. I've also done that in the case with these little groups. Sometimes I'll say, Gabriela, I would love for you to share with the rest of the group. And Gabriela was like, no, I really don't. I, I'm, I'm like nervous or I'm shy or whatever it is that, that's happening. Can I share that with them? Yeah, and I do. And I credit you. And I do that sharing out with them. So those are the ways that you kind of, uh, you can use the, the breakout rooms and technology to help. And as well, when they're working on a, a shared Google document, what I'm going through and I'm pointing out, I'm highlighting, hmm, excellent point by Gabriela. Wow, I love this. I want to ask a follow-up question to Andrea. That way, again, they know I'm checking. They know I'm looking. But I'm not looking, checking to see if they have a right or right answer. I'm more catching those really good moments or aha moments um, with them and highlighting them to the rest of the group. In fact, Diego, those moments that you call the aha moments, uh, it sounds to me like you're describing really powerful um, signs of engagement. And I think that as we all know it, when a student is engaged is that you have found the mechanism whereby you know their emotions are, are heightened and, and we know that when when a student is emotionally involved the emotional climate of the classroom is conducive to deeper learning and we do understand um from the research that's been done and certainly after the onset of pandemic that uh 
emotions play a huge role in the learning process and uh, they are the gatekeepers to our motivation. They are the gatekeepers to our cognition. They are the gatekeepers to our attention. So definitely addressing um, students by way of, you know, really engaging them by what, what is their interest, what their talents are, um, can, can be conducive to achieving their full potential. And um, I think uh, I'd like to ask you now, you, you gave us a couple examples of, of how to, as you ponder curriculum, as you ponder seating preferences or policies, um, what are some other resources that you think um, could assist teachers in making their classrooms, their virtual classrooms or physical classrooms, a more welcoming, um, safe place whereby engagement can be, can be prioritized? Okay, uh, one of the things I think that's really important is with students is to limit multitasking. And by, by that, I mean having, having them give them spaces and time so, to, so they can dedicate their full attention to something. And by that, I mean giving short uh, explanations, instructions, giving students um, clear expectations and staff about what's expected. What tends to happen is we, I assign something. I want you guys to write me uh, a, um, an argumentative paragraph. You guys write me the paragraph and then I look into it and I'm saying, oh, Andrea, <coughs> a clear thesis statement. Uh, there, there, there is no examples. It's missing a closing se send, uh, statement and uh, there are no transition words, et cetera. But if I haven't made that clear to students, my, what, what I consider a, a good, strong, argumentative paragraph might be very different from what you consider. So what ends up happening there by, by me not being very clear, um, first, it's frustrating to you. Second, you feel like you're not competent. You can't, you know, you're not good. Um, so it's very important for me to make clear the same thing with my teachers. If I want something done a specific way, I use an exemplar, I use a model, or I show them. Uh, and I also try to facilitate for them to doing multitasking. I'll give you an example. I give them an assignment. I want you guys to do a shared writing piece on something. And go into Google, Google Docs, and I want you to share. I want you to create a, a template where you're all sharing whatever. What do I do as a teacher? What do I suggest to my teachers? And I do this as a principal with my teachers. I go ahead and I do a little, I do the work myself. The, I set up the skeleton, I set up, because I don't want them spending time setting up, deciding how wide, what kind of color, color fonts. I want them focused on learning. I want them focused on, on discussion. I, so, and then I don't want them to do it a certain way. For example, Andrea, your group does your spreadsheet a, a certain way. And then Gabriela, your, yours does it another way. And your group, Andrea, might be saying, Uy, Gabriela's, theirs is much better. Ours stinks, you know? So again, the focus is not on what it should be. So I go ahead and I do the legwork and I set up the schedule. I'm not the schedule. I set up the spreadsheet or whatever it is, if it's a Google sheet. And I have them populate with the information. I want them to focus on thinking. It's the same thing. I don't ask students to copy something. <clears throat> I share it with them using the technology. I share it with them on the board and the instructions as well. I, if I'm using uh, like Zoom, I'll put in the chat. The instructions are there so they can go back and look at it if they want. I make sure it's in their Google Slides. Um, I make it, I, make, I do a lot of the, as much of the work as I can so that they can focus on what they need to focus on. So every morning, for example, with my staff, I send them a daily newsletter every single day. So it takes me 45 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour each night to do it. But that way they know what's expected. They know what's going on that day. I use that newsletter to congratulate them, to say thank you for such and such effort. Thank you for doing this. And I ask my teachers to do the same thing in, in Google Classrooms to make sure that they put up uh, positive messages, that they recognize the good work that the classroom is doing, uh, and that they put everything uh, they take the time to write everything so that students know there's one local, uh, localized or centralized place where they can always go to find information so that they're not wondering, what do I have to do? Do I have to do it this way? Do I have to do it another way? So I think that's, that's like a, a key tenet for me of, of, of creating that good, positive um, environment. Thank you. 
for learning. Yeah, well, <clears throat> one question though, um, all the things that you have mentioned, I think put a lot of pressure on teachers, uh, which is, I mean, it's what they need to do and it's, it's fine. But I think um, one of the concerns right now, it's something that resonates throughout the teachers community is, um, how worn out they feel. So um, you, you've gone into great depth about what, you know, how teachers can, well, I don't know, look, look out for the compassion aspect with their students, but um, what about for the teachers community? Do you think, are there specific things that we should be careful and mindful of, you know, in order to help them out so that they can do all this extra work and extra um, attention that they need to pay to their students and the way they do their classes now and so on? Yes, I agree. As a matter of fact, I think the educator, uh, Will Richardson, uh, mentions a practice where every year he, he examines a school, he recommends schools look at all their practices and decide what, which practices they still need why did they start using this? Why did we start doing this? Do we still need to do this? Is it necessary? Is it working? How is it working or not working? And then decide to get rid of minimum one each year and if more. So I look at it kind of like a, a weed, you know, like weeding your garden, weed, feed mm. and seed. Weed is, let's look at what we don't need to do anymore. And I do that as a principal with my teachers all the time. Uh, feed, feed, let's nourish, let's continue at, um, strengthening and helping them and supporting them and doing what's working and seeding. Let's think about the future. What can we begin now? Which practices can we begin now to in the future um, will, will bring us good benefits? And what do I, how, how do I do that with my teachers? For example, I do that, that daily newsletter. All the information they need is there. It's on a Google Drive. So if they want to if they, they think, oh, we're supposed to turn in something this Friday, it was sent out in a newsletter, I think, on Friday, but I don't remember what it is. They can just go to the shared Google Drive and find it anytime. It makes their life easier. What else do I do? If I, if I add something, I try to take away two things. Um, that's why my meetings are very short, and my meetings are I send a clear agenda beforehand. They, they, we follow the agenda. We do some you know general chit-chat. Um, but we follow the agenda, and then I try to cut my meetings short. Uh, I, my, most of my weekly meetings, I have a weekly meeting, my teachers are 10, 15 minutes, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll stay on with a little more time with Gabriela or with Andrea, or they'll ask me for questions. What else do I do? Um, I have a WhatsApp group uh, with, for my middle school and one for junior school, and throughout the day, I remind, I remind, I remind, and I remind, and I tell them ahead of time. Look, I'm trying to take, you have a lot on your plate, you have a lot on your shoulders, and you may forget something. So I'm going to be reminding, friendly reminder that we have to do such and such by tomorrow. Uh, what did I do? We created a time at the school that's called flex time. Flex time in middle school is a two, peer, two hours during the school, school week where students, uh, for example, fifth graders have it on Friday at eight o'clock, eight to nine. And what happens during flex time? Students work on their individual projects uh, or on the individual classes. I assign three to four teachers during that time. The teachers, whether it be at school, face-to-face -face, or now virtual, the teachers are available on a, on a Zoom. The teacher, the student can, can go on and, and ask the teacher, hey, can you help me with this? I didn't understand this or vice versa, the teacher can can um, can reach out to a student and say, Gabriel, I really want to talk to you about such and such. And if the students are working fine, everything is working good, the teachers use that time for planning, for PLC times to meet as they're doing that. And, and just to, and when they're at school, it's kind of a relaxing time because they're really there, just there for what students need. Uh, so that, that gives them, that helps them a lot. Um, what else do I do? Uh, Another thing that's also important is I try to keep them in the loop. So if a student or parent complains to me or asks me something, before I talk to the parent or meet with the parent, I meet with the teacher. I think it's something out of respect. And I let them know, listen, this parent is a bit upset about this and this. Uh, what can you tell me? What's going on? I listen to the teacher. I hear what's going on with the teacher. And then if the mom says to me, ah, that Gabriela, she does this, I say, listen, first of all, that's not the Gabriela that you described. is not the Gabriela we know. I defend my teachers to parents and to students. It doesn't mean I don't listen. And I said, okay, I will listen. What are you gonna do about it? What's gonna happen? 
I'm, I'm going to speak with the teacher. Once I speak to the teacher, I'll get back. I'll get back to you. Those little things create, um, let's say, a, a shared trust, a mutual trust between my teachers and me. For example, today, one of my teachers, another thing that I do to make their life easier is, again, having very clear expectation. One of my teachers says to me, on Monday, uh, I, need, I, I need to leave a little bit earlier if it's possible because of such and such. I already spoke to Juanita. She's going to cover my last 20 minutes with my kids and all that. And why do I mention that? Because... I mentioned it. If you need some time, there's something personal. You don't need to get into the details with me unless it becomes a problem. But what, what do I ask you? Find somebody to take care of the kids. Because what's important for us? Our kids <laughs> learning. Okay? But your time is important as well. So, Gabriela, if you need that time off, that 30 minutes in the afternoon, speak to one of your coworkers like Andrea. And then Andrea, you say, Andrea, can you switch with me? And then we'll switch. And then I'll cover your class next week. And if you come to me with a solution, my response is, great. And, and at the beginning, they usually try to get into it. Listen, it's because of this and this. They try to, like, convince me. I say, listen, you don't need to justify it. If it's personal, it's personal. Is it important for you? Yes. Are my kids going to be covered? Yes. Take it. Go for it. Those are the kinds of things where I, and, and I'm also just very mindful of not giving them any busy work. Any kind of busy work, like some of the, I remember I was at a school and the owners wanted the teachers to call each of the parents for something. I said, when I'm not paying for the cell phone uh, minutes, I'm not paying for their four or five hours. They're going to have to do this after school. They're going to be calling each parent uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes or more. Uh, let's find a different way. So I fight for my teachers as well to protect their time and to give them the time that they need to get what, what, what's really important done. Diego, you've uh, really gone into depth and detail, giving us some um, resources and different routines that we can instill and um, educational communities that are following here today. I'm certain we'll have some takeaway. We have about three minutes left, Diego, um, in order to sum up uh, everything that I've been hearing today is about uh, instilling this deep empathy, um, beginning with self-care and you you are such a promoter of that. That is such an honorable way to lead. And in doing so, you are able to instill the other word that comes up all the time is, uh, is trust. And it's, it's about a trust-based culture that you have cultivated and nourished. So um, we really applaud that. And uh, it's great to, to learn about how it really happens in the concrete sense. Is there any advice that you want to leave our uh, viewing audience with? Um, if they uh, are starting along these lines of wanting to implement, um, you know, being, being on top of their compliance, uh, yet uh, doing it compassionately. In other words, without sacrificing good learning, right? Which is what, you know, schooling and our, our academic experience needs to be about. Without sacrificing the good learning, how can we bring the compassion to the, the center of the table to drive learning through this uh, understanding that there needs to be well being? Um, maybe some words of advice. We have two minutes left, Diego, uh, to wrap it up. That would be great. Well, I think the first thing, is, and this is kind of, I guess it's, it's either you have it or you don't, but I am very clear. You have to care about your, your staff, your, your teachers, your students, and, and, your, and your parents. And in my way of, of doing that is really focusing on what they need and what, what, what needs to happen for them. So, I mean, and why, why do I mention that? I know this is a lot of the people listening to this are, are school leaders. And one of the things I'm, you have to be adamant about, uh, about is, do I have the right people in my staff? If I know Gabriela is not being nice with my students, and I know Gabriela is not, a, is not a being accountable, because for me, accountability is not me being on top of Gabriela's back. For me, the accountability comes from Gabriela. She knows what her responsibilities are. She knows what's expected. She has, she knows what, you know, clearly what needs to be done. And I trust that she gets that done. My job is I accompany her, not as a policeman to make sure that she gets things done, but as, 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 a, as a guide, as a coach, a, as, a, as, a, as a partner to make sure that she makes that, gets that work done. But if I see that Gabriela just doesn't have it and, and I have to be on top of her because she really doesn't care about kids, then I have to make that tough choice. And I don't care how nice of a person Gabriela is in other aspects. If she's not what's best for my kids, she's not what's best for my school. 
And I know that sounds harsh, but uh, that for me is really important. And you know what people tell me, uh, my, one of my teachers, uh, my teachers often tell me is, you don't, you don't bark very much, but when you need to bite, you do. And what they mean is that when something is important, I will have that honest discussion with you. And I said, listen, I'm concerned about this. What's going on? I will listen to you. How can we, how can, what can we do? How can we get to the other side? How can we make things happen? By bite, I, what I mean is that I'm, I'm aware of what's going on. I'm on top of things, but I'm not on top of people every day to make that done. I create an environment where I trust that it is done, but then I do check in, but I don't check in to make sure it's being done. I check in. How, how is your process doing? Do you need any help? How can I help you? This past week, for example, I started mm-hmm. calling teachers one by one and just asking them, how are you doing? How are things? Um, That's what's such a big thing? and important, uh, important way to just remind us. And thank you for that reminder, Diego. It, sorry to interrupt you. Um, okay. but to, to start with um, the very, going back to basics and how are you doing? You said it. How okay. are you doing? Exactly. How are you feeling today? And that, that goes back to the very essential and which also you've reminded us uh, as we close today that uh, there's nothing more important than team and knowing that together everyone achieves more and holding ourselves accountable and responsible. And I think you've uh, over and over demonstrated that you're, you're not the policeman behind your, your, your teachers, but they each feel a sense of commitment and ownership in what they're doing. And it's because you've, you've allowed that to happen through this culture of trust that you've created. We, we really celebrate and validate that effort. And I hope that our viewing audience has uh, really taken um, all these great points and this, these great resources and, uh, and please continue to follow Follow us. We're here in order to co-construct this new landscape in education. We really deeply thank you, Diego Sanchez from Gimnasio Los Caos in Colombia. Thank you, Gabriela, for being here today. I hope you've both had a really good time because I sure did. Um, thank you for connecting. And uh, any closing remark, Diego? No, just, uh, you know, do what you love and love what you're doing. And I think that's it is, is a school. I think, as you know, in, in schools, we are, we're made of something different. Uh, teachers, school leaders, um, it, the, well, we, we, have to, we have to continue to be guided by what we know is best for our students, period. Uh, and what's best for our students is, is you often be uh, what's best for our staff as well. If our staff feel taken care of, if our staff feels they're respected, we validate them, we value them, then I know they'll do their best for their, their, their students because st- teachers are made of something very special. And thank what you. What a beautiful closing remark. We love it. Gabriela, maybe you'll make that into a post by Diego Sanchez from Gimnasio Los Cabos. Do what you love and love what you're doing. We love you, Diego. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Take care and be safe. Un abrazo a todos los de Gimnasio Los Cabos that are watching and every other educator and school leader out there. Thanks for being with us. And Bye-bye thank you for this time. Bye-bye. Thank you.